hepatology pharmacist at St George's Hospital in London, and I'm the chair of the British Hepatology Pharmacy Group. This presentation is going to cover a brief overview of the functions of the liver and liver disease. I'll then discuss fatty liver disease, its relationship with diabetes and the potential treatments available. The liver is a critical organ in the human body that's responsible for over 500 functions that help support metabolism, immunity, digestion, detoxification and vitamin storage, among other functions. It comprises around 2% of an adult's body weight and it's a unique organ due to its dual blood supply. 75% of blood is supplied from the portal vein, which drains the gut, bringing nutrients to the liver and the remaining 25% is supplied by the hepatic artery. The liver plays a role in nearly every organ system in the body. It plays a central role in the maintenance of blood glucose levels by supplying glucose when levels are low and taking it up when there's plentiful supply. It converts glucose to glycogen to be stored in the liver and the muscles. It also has an essential role in the digestion of dietary fats. It produces bile salts from cholesterol, which are essential for the emulsification of fats in the gut. It also handles cholesterol homeostasis and is the storage location for fat soluble vitamins. The liver contains about 600 ml of blood, which is 13% of the total circulating volume, and the portal vein flows through the liver, transporting and detoxifying about one litre of blood every minute by cup for cells. It plays a role in hemostasis with clotting factors and protein synthesis. And it's also a very important in the processing of drugs. However, it's such a robust organ that there generally has to be significant damage for the processing of these drugs to be affected. It's a major site of drug metabolism with the hepatic cytochrome P450 system, which we are well aware of. Many drugs undergo first pass metabolism, which can be reduced in patients with advanced liver disease. And it also produces albumin and decreased levels of albumin could result in increased levels of highly protein bound drugs, which is important for those drugs with a narrow therapeutic index. So liver disease accounts for around 2 million deaths annually as reported by the Global Burden of Disease update in 2023. This is around 4% of all deaths worldwide. These deaths are largely due to complications of cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma, which is liver cancer. The major causes of chronic liver disease include viral hepatitis B and C, and there's currently a World Health Organization elimination target for these two viruses by 2030. Alcohol-related liver disease is another cause, and last but not least, what we're focusing on today, non-alcohol fatty liver disease, or NAFLD. There has, however, been an update to this terminology from many expert groups across the world, and they would like it to be renamed Metabolic Dysfunction Associated Steatotic Liver Disease, or MASLD. The reason for this is that NAFLD is generally always associated with metabolic factors, such as obesity, insulin resistance, and high lipids. It is also hoped that this will reduce stigma by taking out the word fatty and removing the word alcohol. Marsled is now estimated to be the most common cause of liver disease globally and is now the most common reason for liver transplants in many countries. This map demonstrates the prevalence of Marsled worldwide according to global regions data, which has been collected between 1990 and 2019. It shows the average prevalence of Marsled worldwide is around 30%. And this ranges from 25% in Western Europe to 44% in Latin America. The graph also shows that the incidence has been increasing over the last 30 years. And this increase parallels the increasing number of patients with type 2 diabetes and the obesity crisis across the world. So what is fatty liver? It's the accumulation of fat in the liver, and it's defined as detectable steatosis on imaging, which is normally an ultrasound scan, or the presence of over 5% liver fat seen on biopsy. For a diagnosis of Marsland, you must rule out alcohol or other liver diseases as a cause. Other causes could include certain drugs, including valproate, amiodarone, tamoxifen, and steroids. And it's also been seen with total parental nutrition. The pathogenesis remains incompletely understood, but more recently, the multiple hit theory was proposed. It describes different hits on the liver, including insulin resistance, hormones from the adipose tissue, nutritional factors, 
gut microbiota and the genetic and epigenetic factors. These multiple hit promote inflammation and affect the hepatic structure and function, leading to liver disease, liver failure and liver cancer. However, Marsod extends beyond its impact on the liver health and it affects various systems throughout the body and the majority of deaths are actually attributable to cardiovascular disease. As I said, Marsod is a multi-system disease and it is closely linked to type 2 diabetes. However, the link between Marsod and type 2 diabetes is more complex than previously thought and the relationship seems to be bi-directional. Evidence indicates that Marsod might precede and or promote the development of type 2 diabetes and that the risk of developing type 2 diabetes parallels the severity of Marsod. Patients with Marsod are twice as likely to develop type 2 diabetes and studies have shown that up to 65% of patients with type 2 diabetes have Marsod. Although up to 80% of patients who are classified as as obese has Marsod also, it can also occur in people with lower BMI. This is considered lean Marsod. It's more common in those people who have unhealthy diet and report a sedentary lifestyle. This diagram was presented at the Global NASH conference this year and demonstrates what I have already said, that it's a multi-system disease associated with metabolic syndrome. And these factors significantly contribute to the increased risks of adverse outcomes beyond that of liver health. For example, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, and type 2 diabetes. The progression of fatty liver is a disease continuum. Patients develop non-alcohol steatohepatitis, previously known as NASH, but now termed MASH. This is a necroinflammatory process, and fibrosis occurs in about 30% of these patients. The extent of fibrosis predicts, predicts liver-related mortality, so it's important that patients are staged correctly. It is difficult to stage these patients as they may or may not have elevated liver function tests, including AST and ALT, but non-invasive markers can predict severity of fibrosis. It's often done using a machine called a fibroscan, but calculations such as FIB4 and APRI, or more recently, the enhanced liver fibrosis test can be used. But it's important to be aware that pharmacists and primary care and community, it's very difficult to know the presence or extent of fatty liver by just looking at a patient. Type 2 diabetes is an established risk factor for the faster progression to MASH, cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma. And in addition, patients with advanced fibrosis have an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes and improvements in Marsal can actually reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes. So now we know how it's diagnosed, we can talk about the treatment. So unfortunately, there is currently no licensed drug treatment available. And the only treatment we can suggest is lifestyle modification, which includes weight loss and increased exercise. Studies have shown that weight loss of between seven to 10% clears liver fat in patients with marsled and obesity. For those with lean marsled, they can still see improvements with a three to 5% weight loss. A landmark study from Cuba suggested that a reduction in body weight of 10% could result in regression of fibrosis at 12 months. However, we also are aware that very few people are able to achieve this and definitely maintain it. It is difficult to tailor weight loss to each patient and most liver clinics do not have the dietetic support to refer everybody with Marsled for advice and support. In general, the advice is to aim for a calorie deficit of 500 to 1,000 kilocalories per day, but it's also to make sure that the food you actually consume doesn't contain refined sugars and saturated fats. This is especially difficult in Western and some Asian diets, and studies have shown that a Mediterranean diet is found to be the best, but we know this isn't suitable for everyone. In general, in my clinics, I would encourage patients to follow the idea of a healthy plate, half the plate of vegetables, a quarter carbohydrates and a quarter protein. And in addition to weight loss through diet, we would generally advise patients to do 150 minutes of aerobic or resistance exercise per week. 
This advice is not specifically for patients just with fatty liver, and pharmacists are well placed to encourage a healthy lifestyle. In some areas, pharmacists are also able to prescribe exercise help with supplemented gym memberships, and they can direct patients to community exercise programs. Another option for weight loss for patients with elevated BMI is bariatric surgery. This has been shown to improve the cardiometabolic profile and have a sustained effect, but it has its risks, especially in those with cirrhosis who have decompensated in the past or have portal hypertension. In addition, although we advise those patients with Marsal to lose weight through diet, it's important we're careful when advising those with cirrhosis to reduce their intake, as they're often actually sarcopenic and need regular nutritional intake, including snacks overnight. There are also a number of weight loss medications available, and a number of these can now be bought in pharmacies or over the counter. Glucagon-like peptide 1 agonists have shown to reduce the content of liver fat, and this is sometimes accompanied by an improvement in histological features of steatohepatitis. There's also some evidence that Orlistat can reduce liver fat. However, it's not clear if the weight loss medicines have an effect directly on fatty liver, which is superior to diet and exercise, so we should always re recommend them alongside each other. Pharmacists must also advise with caution as there is a number of unregulated weight loss treatments being sold online and in pharmacies, which could be harmful to the patient and the liver. As I said, there's no, currently no licensed drug treatments for Marzold. However, most of the international guidelines, including ESL, Arzold and Asian Pacific guidelines, recommend an off-label treatment of, P of pioglitazone and sometimes vitamin E. This is following evidence from the Pivens trial. Pioglitazone is a PPAR agonist with insulin sensitizing effects. It's licensed currently as an anti-diabetic medicine. The Pivens trial demonstrated limited evidence for its use as it showed resolution of NASH, but it did not have any effect on fibrosis. Vitamin E had less evidence, but did show some improvements on NASH after 96 weeks of treatment. The benefits of pioglitazone were reiterated at the Global NASH Summit this year after a promising therapeutic option and not only improves NASH but also shows a decrease in incidence of stroke and myocardial infarction. However both drugs come with their own risks and pioglitazone was actually banned from the market in France due to its risk of bladder cancer and so in practice these medicines are actually very infrequently used as pioglitazone has risks of bladder cancer and heart failure. There are, however, a number of active clinical trials in Marsald and NASH. These are targeting NASH and F2, F3 fibrosis rather than cirrhosis. Combination therapy is also now being considered, which will treat type 2 diabetes and obesity alongside fatty liver due to the interplay of these and metabolic syndrome. The lean study showed that one of the GLP-1 agonists improved NASH when compared to placebo. There's also two other promising trials, Maestro Nash and Regenerate, which have shown their drugs to show an improvement of fibrosis. As there is an interplay between the gut microbiota and muzzled, another clinical trial studies symbiotic treatment, which is a combination of prebiotic and probiotics. This will provide a treatment option that could be recommended by pharmacists, as they're often bought over the counter. However, there's currently not enough evidence to recommend them for the treatment of fatty liver, as the studies have shown no substantial improvement in the measure of liver disease. The metabolic risk factors must also be optimised, and this can result in a decrease of other risk factors. And this is definitely an area where pharmacists can help. For patients with diabetes, it's imperative that they have achieved good glucose control, regardless of the agent's direct effect on Marsold. Studies of metformin show that it doesn't directly affect the liver, however, it can aid weight loss. And as I've also already mentioned, there is evidence for the GLP-1 agonists, which can currently be prescribed for diabetes and weight loss. And the most common cause of death, as I said earlier, from Marsold is actually cardiovascular disease. So it's important to optimise treatment of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. A question that we get asked a lot is, are statins safe in patients with in liver patients? And the answer is generally yes. 
There was actually a meta-analysis in patients with chronic liver disease, which showed that statins are associated with a 50% reduction in hepatic decompensation and all-cause mortality. Statins can cause abnormal lip blood tests, and we know this. It's normally transaminitis, so a raised ALT or AST, and this usually happens within the first six months and is more frequently reported with the torvastatin and simvastatin. But the risk of liver failure is about one in a million. And the advice is generally that you can start a statin even with liver blood tests mildly abnormal, which they often are in mild blood patients, as they're often required a statin to treat dyslipidemia. However, I would recommend asking for advice from a hepatologist if liver blood tests are over three times your perimeter normal, especially if they're persisting. And it's also important to remember to counsel patients on muscle pains when they start a statin for any indication. So diagnosing and managing Marsold in patients with type 2 diabetes is imperative as it's to mitigate the risks associated with this silent multi-system disease. All patients should, with Marsold should be screened for type 2 diabetes and the European and American guidelines recommend a fasting blood glucose or haemoglobin A1C or a standard oral glucose tolerance test in those with high risk. This is definitely an area pharmacists can get involved in to ensure that screening has been performed in these groups of patients. So in summary, the incidence of liver disease is increasing worldwide and fatty liver disease is now the most common cause. There is a close link between Marsal and type two diabetes with 45 to 65% of patients with type two diabetes having Marsal. And this increases the risk of progression to fibrosis and cirrhosis. And conversely, Marsal doubles the risk of type two diabetes. Lifestyle change is currently the only accepted treatment for Marsal and pharmacists can play an active role in improving diet and encouraging exercise. It's also important to optimize blood glucose control in those with type 2 diabetes. There's currently no licensed treatment for Marsal, but pioglitazone is an option, and some of the weight loss drugs may help, but there are many new drugs in the pipeline currently in clinical trials. Pharmacists can play an important role in prevention and intervention in those with type 2 diabetes and Marsal.